Good afternoon, brethren. It was two weeks ago that we were at the Feast of Tabernacles. And um, I know we have all come back. We really had, of course, quite a bit of, um, you know, persons uh, uh, affected by the, the virus that was going around. Thank God for taking them through, and some are still um, being uh, reco- are still being recovered. But we really trust in God. I'm very happy to see you here, and uh, we trust that, of course, uh, those brethren who are not yet uh, have not yet recovered will uh, really be much better in in short order. Now, I think you know the the subject on which I will be speaking today, because at the feast, it was on the very last great day that I received the message about this war that had broken out in the Middle East between Israel and the Israeli and the Gaza uh, people. Um, And that's what I want to talk today. I would certainly like to acknowledge the number of persons who are online listening to us because this will be of interest to them. And I certainly acknowledge those who are visiting with us Um, today because this might be of interest to you. But yes, it was on the last great day of the feast that a terrorist group called Hamas decided to move into Israel. And evidently they have been planning their attack for quite some time so that it was a big surprise that a country that is known for its high level of intelligence gathering, its alertness, its training, that it didn't have the slightest clue that this break-in would have taken place. What's more, the United States of America which prides itself in being the most developed country and the country that is best prepared militarily for war, didn't have the slightest clue that this would happen. Certainly, this reminds me of the words of Jesus, which tells us that when we do not even think of it. When we think it is peace and safety, it's going to be sudden destruction. And that seems to be what overcame. And thousands of people the world over witness this surge of violence as rockets rained down on Israel. Rockets in numbers that have never been seen. Nobody knew that this group was so equipped, so prepared. And from land, sea, and sky, they were able to be attacking on all levels in order to defeat. And certainly, the damage was big. The dam- in fact, it is the largest Damage, well, at least since the Yom Kippur War in 1973, that this really um, took place. So it really was something of a magnitude that was not even considered to happen. And it left so many people perplexed grappling for answers. How did this happen? 
Where did it come from? What does this mean? Because if we find ourselves in this situation, it means that something has really gone wrong with us, say the Israelis and the Americans, of course, alongside them. And where is it going? Is a big question. Now, most commentators on this subject are arguing about who is right and who is wrong, how many have been, persons have been fallen victim, how many are damaged, what kind of, you know, on what kind of scale the damage has gone on. But my duty today is not to report those things. My duty is not to go in and to talk about how many people are damaged and compare the numbers and all that kind of a thing. Leave that to the news audience, the news um, reporters. My duty today is to provide a biblical perspective on this issue, this conflict. And what I want to do today in this sermon is to show that this war is not solely about nations and about political ideology. My duty is to show instead that this conflict is the manifestation of a spiritual battle. It needs to be understood by no one else, by the church, what really is the significance of this war. And for us to comprehend the depths of this perspective, the only place we can turn to is the Bible, not the newspapers, not the television screens. We need to go to the Bible because it is the only the Bible that offers insights. It's only the Bible that provides wisdom and understanding of this conflict. And so the title of this sermon today is The Israeli Gaza War A Biblical Perspective. Yes. Now, before I delve into the topic, I want to make some comments on the importance and value of. Bible prophecy, because this is the genre in which this sermon falls. It falls in the prophetic genre. And what I want to have us to have in the back of our minds is that prophecy is of high value to the church of God. In fact, one third of the Bible is regarded as being prophetic information. And in this particular matter of the Israeli-Gaza conflict, prophecy provides us with a, a framework, a framework that helps us to interpret much of what is going on, both at a historical and at a spiritual level. So much of what we talk about today will rely upon the prophetic features within the scriptures. What the prophetic work 
in the Bible does, it helps us to make comparisons. It helps us to look back to see other events in Scripture that may have some relationship to this particular event. And whilst it does not offer details, so we don't get any details, specifics, and so on, what it does provide us with is to see the spiritual significance of the event. And that is most important, to understand the spiritual significance of the event. Many people are looking at the economic impact of the event, the way in which lives have been taken, the, the threat that it poses. And that is, has its, its use in our secular world. But it does not answer the most important question, what does this mean? For us spiritually. So I want to move into the presentation itself so that we can have a perspective on what this really means for us, for God's people, what it means for the world because it has the widest effect that we can think of. It's important to understand that at the center of this event that it is not the Israelis or the Palestinians that this is about. Yes, they are involved. Yes, they are affected. But they are not the centri central thing or the central focus of this event. The central issue behind this event is the land of Israel is the city of Jerusalem. And what is so important about it is God's relationship to in Gaza. That's not really what it is. It is of a higher order. It's a spiritual matter. And it's being played out The people there are embroiled in spiritual warfare without knowing it. Because they are not looking at it from that perspective. But it should be clear to us in the church. It should be, we should understand it. Why is, this, why is it that the war is going on after God speaks all about Jerusalem and what he, how he will protect it and how he will guard it and how he will watch over it. Why is it then that people are fierce enough to approach it and to attack it? Well, the answer is in Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 14. And God, in speaking of Lucifer, God says in Isaiah 14, 13 to 14, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. We should make the connection already. Because we know 
That Zion is where the throne of God is coming. That is a place on the earth where the throne of God will be established. So when Lucifer says, I shall ascend to the throne of God, we need to be understand in the church the significance of that statement with Jerusalem where the throne of God will be established. Satan is The spiritual force, the evil force that influences the nations to attack Jerusalem. So the Arabs, the Jews, they are, God has set, set up Jerusalem as we have done in earlier studies that God established and brought them to the land. And they are there for a purpose because God does not want the nations to come in and to take the land. And Judah is a warrior of God. Abraham told, not Abraham, um, Jacob told his sons when he was describing each one of them. He said, Judah, you are a lion's whelp. When the children of Israel was to go into the land in Canaan, the question was asked, who should go into the land first? God said, Judah. Because they are the ones who will go in and clear out the, the giants. And Judah when you look in the scriptures, if you remember that sermon I gave some time ago, the priority of Judah, you will see that God has appointed Judah for a purpose. They're not faithful to God. No. They're not being faithful to God. It's disappointed. People would wonder, how come God works with them and they are not, you know, people? that's not what God is about when it comes to Judah. God has already said that he has, he has put Israel on hold for sake of the Gentiles. God is not working with them right now. The time will come when that will happen. But right now, it's a different kind of work that they are doing. Jeremiah 3 and verse 17. It says, speaking of when Christ shall return. He says, at that time they will call Jerusalem the throne of God. This is the connection. The throne of God. Jerusalem will be called the throne of God. And all nations will gather in Jerusalem to honor the name of the Lord. No longer will they follow the stubbornness of their evil hearts. This is the reason the war is taking place. Because Jerusalem is exclusively a unique city unto God. And God is saying, and he has put in his word that his throne is going to be, Jerusalem will be called the throne of God. So you can see the relationship between the work of Lucifer who has threatened to ascend to the throne of God 
to heighten his throne over God's throne. And what is happening here? So look at what he has put in the hearts of the people who are against Jerusalem. Look at this particular text. I didn't, yes, it is in Psalm 83, verses 4 to 8. All of this is in the Bible, you know. All this is written there. That is why prophecy gives you such current information. It can tell you what is going to happen in tomorrow's newspaper and, and further. Psalm 83, verse 48. This is what, just as how Lucifer says, I will ascend to the throne of God. Here's what you know he's telling the Arab nations about Jerusalem. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation. We've heard that. We've heard that coming out of, you know, the, the, the Islamic world towards Jerusalem. Come, let us cut them off from being a nation. But it's in the psalm. It's written there. It's prophecy. And it's telling us just where it is going. This is war. This is where war comes from. That the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one another, with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites and the Moabites and the Hagrites, Gobal, Ammon, Amal Amalek, Philistia, with the inhabitants of Tyre, Assyria also has joined with them. The nations are joining up to destroy. To destroy this little city and the people who are there. All coming from this plan that Satan has to ascend his throne above the stars of God. And this is how he uses it. In other words, you see, we do not understand how the spiritual works sufficiently. We do not understand sufficiently how the spiritual world works. But we have got glimpses of it. We got a glimpse of it when Peter, after Christ spoke and said that he will have to suffer and die. And Peter said, Lord, no, no, Lord, don't you say that. And Jesus turned to him and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Not Peter. Get thee behind me, Satan. Because Satan speaks to our minds, through our ears, through our senses. We need to understand that. The power. He's called the prince of the power of the air. And he has the capacity to make you think that what you're thinking is your thinking when it is his thinking. He has that capacity. We have to be very careful, brethren. Because the evil... The power, that is why the scriptures say we fight not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities in high places. We have to be aware of that. I know a lot of people would look at this and say, oh my goodness, look at how the Philistine, the, um, the, 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 the Palestinians, <laughs> look at how the Palestinians are suffering Look at the tragedies and all that kind of thing. That is a part of the work of Satan. Even the, the work of, you know, 
the way in which mothers and, and, and babies and innocent people in Palestine are suffering. It's part of the work that he has set up to create the hate. Because the more you can create these situations, the more hatred is going to come to Israel. I want us to think and think in a different way. I want us to think not using the newspapers, but using the Bible. Let the Bible be your influencer to tell you what is going on. These words, come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be remembered no more is what perpetuates humans, humans to be involved in the way they are involved. But where do those words come from? It comes from Lucifer. And this is a mantra that has sustained conflicts and wars in the region. And it is for this reason that the state of Israel is involved in wars and they are they are really warriors. They are real warriors. It's not going to stay like that for, for long. Remember, it's the same people who have gone into captivity where the nations come in and take them. And you know how it is going to go when Jerusalem is surrounded and, and all that. But what we must remember, brethren, is that when we speak about Israel and Palestine, you may think you're looking at two small countries. But the way it, is, it, is, it works is that the matter there is so sensitive and penetrating that when you speak of Israel and Palestine, you're speaking of the whole world. Notice, for example, the United States is down there in the, in the Mediterranean with, with its, its most devastating equipment. And notice there are meetings taking place between Russia, China, Iran, because they are observing to see how they are going to relate to this. So although you're talking about Israel and Palestine, it really is a world affair. A war there to the extent of what may be developing can become global. So we must remember that when we speak about conflicts in the Middle East, it's not something that just stays in the Middle East. It is something that impacts widely around the globe. But this war which began on October 7, 2023, the last great day of the feast, is different from all the other wars that has taken place in the Middle East. It is different, very different. And I'll tell you why. And I'll tell you of the possible impacts that it will have. Why is it different? It is different because by the time this war ends, it will have created certain conditions and circumstances that will make the need for a peace treaty 
in that region of the world. Watch it. We cannot say these things with absolute certainty. But we have enough information that God has given us to know, look out. This could be, go this could be what is going to come up now. Because the level of hatred that this war, the level of anti-Semitism, the level of fear that this war is developing in that part of the world will put the region in a far worse position than it was. And there may be need for a peace, a peace treaty as a result of the damage to relationships in the area. Already, right around the world, newspapers, electronic media, is reporting about the escalation, the, 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 the demonstrations. Other nations, Hezbollah has already done his, begun to do its own intervention. Yemen shot some things, you know, rockets. It was going into Israel, they said, and it was intercepted by the American outfit in the, in the Mediterranean. But already, Iran is sitting there and watching how things are going to go. And you never can tell the level of escalation because the longer the war continues, the more damage will be done to relationships in the area. And that's something we must watch for. There are swords into plowshares and there are spears into pruning hooks. Nations will not take up sword against nations, nor will they train for war anymore. Here is the solution. Here it is coming to you from the word of God to say, This is about mankind, not just about Israel. This is about all the people in Russia, in China, in India, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, all the religions around the world. This is a solution. If you don't want to believe it, try and find out how the Bible came into being. You tell me. How is it possible that a book like this, which was written over thousands of years, he is the one to whom we listen. He gives a command. We follow. And so I want to say a word to you. What must we do What, what must we do, having heard these things? What does God expect of us? Jesus gives the answer. In times of trouble, people tend to lose their sense of order. They tend to become very disoriented. But here's what Jesus says we must do. Now when, this is in Luke 21, verse 28. Now when these things begin to happen, what things? The things about the tribulation and the wars and all that Jesus is saying, when they begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. There is a, something, you know, in the world of the armies that operate, 
they go into training and they learn how to respond. They learn how to respond when the time of war arrives. So nobody has to come and tell them what to do anymore. They already learned and prepared. And Jesus says to us, the answer is to look up. Lift up your head because your redemption draws nigh. Your redemption is something wonderful, something good is about to happen. But what does he mean by look up? Jesus is telling us that when we begin to witness these times of suffering like the tribulation that he spoke about, when the hard times come, he says we should respond. Look up here means hope. We should respond with hope. We should respond with anticipation. Why? Because we have been praying, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. Why is it that when he's coming now, you start to behave certain ways? You should be happy. That's exactly what should be happening to us. The way to respond, instead of fear and despair, he's encouraging us to lift up our heads because we, 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 we are so happy that he's near. Because one of the things that is will be for sure, that once you see those things, once tribulation comes and all the sufferings, you know, oh boy, you can take a deep breath because it is very near. You don't have to be in, a, in, a, in any, what is going to happen to me now? Is, we never knew this was going to come. You didn't know? We knew. But somehow, we did not digest it properly. We must look up because these signs indicate our redemption. And that is Jesus' response to us. Redemption is what we have been working at. Christ died that we may be redeemed. And all of that is already in place. All that is happening now is the, the delivery of the reward. But there is the tribulation that comes. So I pray, brethren, stay faithful. Let this war be a lesson for us. Let it be also one of inspiration for us. Let it be one of gratification where we can be thankful to God for putting us in a place where we can understand these things. Let it be one that causes us to feel the sense of a solution because we can present the gospel to all those who are in despair around the world because the ultimate purpose of all of what God is doing is for us to become sons and daughters of the Most High and to be able to dwell with God when he comes to tabernacle with him. Interesting, it happened at the Feast of Tabernacles. We will tabernacle with him. We need to pray for Jerusalem. We need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We need to understand the need for peace. Although we know it will not fully come until Christ returns. Because there's no peace that man can offer that is lasting. And so let us be, feel a sense of comfort. But let us also feel a sense of pain for those who are suffering. And let us hope for the day to come when we will be able as kings and priests to go out into all the world and to be able to share the gospel of salvation with the billions of people who are in the dark, who Satan has in the dark. But thank God, 
his end too is coming. May God bless you.